Okay. Well, welcome to Club Evmed, everybody, and um, happy Darwin Day. I know it's a couple of days post Darwin Day. Um, Darwin Day is also my parents' anniversary as well as my brother-in-law's birthday, so it's a big day in our in our house. Um, my name is Michael Reiskin. I'm an associate professor at North Carolina State University in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology, and I've been associated with TRISEM for almost a decade now, I think, um, time flies, as a participating faculty and board member, and it's my pleasure today to introduce our speakers. Before I do, uh, let me first welcome you to Club EVMED Conversations, where our goal is to connect the evolutionary medicine community and share exciting research in this multidisciplinarity a multidisciplinary space. If this is an informal setting with an emphasis on open discussion from a variety of perspectives to max maximize diverse viewpoints and really the potential for aha moments from anybody participating. Indeed, since Club EVMED started, when I've been able to attend, these have been some of the most interesting and thought provoking academic events for me over the last few years. Before we start, I'd like to recognize the International Society for Evolution, Medicine and Public Health which also has a well regarded journal that encourages submission of articles related to evolutionary medicine. Many of you may have or should uh, submit some of your work to that journal. The society also organizes an annual meeting and this year it's in Durham uh, in the United Kingdom, not I guess our Durham uh, here in North Carolina and it's in early August and I think Johnny can maybe post some details to that in the chat. Um, Club EVMED is a collaborative effort of 10 evolutionary medicine centers and programs. And speaking of which, let me welcome our newest collaborators, the Brazilian Evolution and Health Study Group located at the University of Sao Paulo, the University of Kiel in Germany, the Kiel Evolution Center, the TransEvo Group, and then finally the Evolutionary Studies Group at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. As I'll remind you, Club EVMED is meant to be conversational. We will start with a shortish presentation, 20 or 25 minutes, during which we do encourage folks to post questions and thoughts in the chat box. You can also raise a hand, although we will wait until the presentation part is over. Speakers will get their time. You can also tweet or X or whatever we call it now about this using hashtag, hashtag Club EVMED. Okay, I will now introduce our two speakers. This is part of a series focused on translated wins in evolutionary medicine, places where we've seen actionable results from taking an evolutionary approach to pressing health issues. Today's topic on making quantifiable predictions of the probability of occurrence of global pandemics um, using an extensive historical record fits this description as a win. This topic will be presented by Drs. Marco Mariani and, and William Pan, or Bill Pan. Dr. Mariani is a professor at University of Padova in engineering and adjunct at Duke University. His background started in hydrological modeling, but now he tackles a diversity of biological and engineering questions with strong quantitative modeling approaches that encompass hydrology, geomorphology, weather, climate change, insect vector biology, coastal resilience, and epidemic prediction. Dr. Pan is the Reed Professor of Global Environmental Health and Population Studies at Duke University. Bill comes from a biostatistics background, which I believe he did just right down the road at UNC Chapel here, here in North Carolina, and was previously at Johns Hopkins, where he's still adjunct. His work includes quantitative epidemiological approaches to answer questions of infectious disease transmission, especially malaria, as well as environmental exposure to heavy metals. His work is typified by interdisciplinary approaches and the use of rich and varied data sources. His field work is primarily in South and Central America, as well as local projects in North Carolina. I got to know Bill a bit better when we co-taught a One Health course last fall, and I've interact and I've rarely interact, interacted with someone who is as deep and wide in his knowledge. He brings a truly interdisciplinary approach to evolutionary medicine. So it is my pleasure to hand the mic off to Marco and Bill for their talk today on extreme value theory and the probability of extreme novel epidemics. So Bill and Marco, it's your mic. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, with Bill, with, uh, we've agreed uh, I will start with some methodological background and then we'll take it uh, uh, to uh, talk about implications uh, more broadly about epidemiology. Uh, let me thank you for inviting me, me us, um, to this meeting. It sounds really exciting. Um, 
uh, also, you know, part of my heart is still in North Carolina. So I've been there, I've been at Duke for a few years uh, and uh, before moving, eventually moving back to Italy, but uh, it's it's fantastic area with great people. And so it's an additional pleasure to do this. Let me share my screen. Um, and please let me know in a second if you see if you see uh, my presentation in presentation mode. Yep, that looks good. Okay, so uh, I will I will try to uh, uh, to go over some uh, some of the basic um, um, uh, methodology that we've used um, to uh, for this work. And let me acknowledge the other co-authors uh, of this work, uh, Gabby Catul at, at Duke University and uh, Anthony, Anthony Parolari, now at Marquette University. Uh, during uh, lockdown and during the pandemic, um, we uh, started chatting about uh, statistics and uh, modeling of, uh, uh, of uh, um, epidemics like many, I guess. Um, and I asked, uh, um, and we started asking a question about which, and again, I'm an engineer as a training, even though I really have never worked as an engineer, I, I, I like to think of myself more of a, a scientist in, a, in, a, in the earth system, broadly, broadly thought, but it was kind of obvious, uh, for me to ask the question, um, about the probability. So we're leaving this pandemic. I mean, we didn't see it coming. How likely is an event such uh, such as this? Um, and then uh, being, again, used to uh, formulating more quantitatively, uh, uh, these type of questions, um, uh, I, I, we, we uh, quickly recognize that uh, you need uh, to formulate a more detailed question. So it's not more, it's not really, the probability of a global epidemic doesn't make much sense. You need more, you need a metric, you need something quantitative and say, you know, pose a question, what is the probability that an epidemic with a magnitude that we'll define in some way, uh, we need to measure it somehow uh, with a magnitude uh, equal to or exceeding that of COVID-19 uh, to occur over, over the next say hundred years, over a lifetime, right? So we, we need a, a time horizon to make, to make sense of this probability. And so uh, I quickly, we quickly realized that it was no obvious answer to that. Um, and that was kind of a sh strange to me to realize that because uh, I was used to, when I was trained as an engineer uh, and, and later when I was doing research uh, in, in risk, uh, natural and anthropogenic risk, uh, we usually think about events that generate risk in terms of the probability of occurrence. That's the basic information that we need to really uh, uh, tackle these problems. So if I am uh, uh, building a dam, I will um, design it so that the probability of failure is somewhere between one in 1,000 and one in 10,000 every year. So that's the, that's the ball range. Um, um, that uh, the ballpark range that we, we're using, or maybe something more, more uh, we're more familiar with, you know, a bridge, you, you, you build it high enough so that a flood will not swept it away. Uh, of course, there's always what we call residual risk. You cannot build it high enough that no flood ever will, 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 will uh, sweep it away. But we, we can set the probability for that to occur. And, and typically that's three in, in 1,000 or five in 1,000. So I was used to, uh, to deal with, with some, I mean, uncertain. Of course, there's uncertainties in all these assessments, but at least you have something to, to, to use to quantitative address the problem. And so I was kind of shocked to see that we we didn't have anything, I couldn't find anything uh, uh, similar in 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 the, in the field of, of epidemics and pandemics, and uh, uh, I was so we started thinking 
um, what do we need? So we need, and that's something that, that is known, uh, to characterize extreme events, we need two ingredients. We need one ingredient. The first ingredient is how often events occur, no matter, doesn't matter if they're extremes or not, extremes or not. How often do events, a flood occur or an epidemic of, occur of whatever size? And then you need a, a condition of probability saying, well, once an event has occurred, what is the probability that that event will be larger than a certain magnitude? And I haven't decided, I haven't specified what this magnitude is. I will, I will do that in a second. And in order to formulate this quantitatively according to these two ingredients, we need data. We need, clearly, we need something to work with, observations. And there were no systematic observations that I could find uh, to kind of apply this framework uh, to, to, uh, to epidemics. So I um, um, started digging into whatever was uh, literature was, was available. That was not entirely during lockdown, what took me a year to do that, um, to work out this information. So if I have a sequence, I hope you can see my, um, my cursor here. If I have a sequence of events and the magnitudes, whatever that is, again, uh, uh, signaled by that red dot associated with these events, I can start working out the frequency. How many events per year do I get or per decade or per hundred years, whatever. I need uh, a frequency of occurrence. And if I have the data, I can then take this data, these values, these red dots, these, these, uh, the length of, this, of these sticks uh, to build a probability distribution such as this, probability of exceedance f of x. With these two ingredients, then I'm able to come up with some um, quantitative uh, estimate of what may be going on in the future. It, but of course, there's, um, uh, there's, a, there's a whole machinery that needs to be put in place uh, that I will try to, to describe in its uh, general uh, outline. Uh, but these are the two ingredients, and, and, and allow me, uh, I, I, will, I will put some of these equations there, but I will try to go over it. Uh, there's a diversity of, 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 of uh, backgrounds here, and clearly uh, this doesn't want to be anything uh, very technically detailed, but um, uh, the, uh, the overall framework here is that uh, if I have this f of x, the probability of exceedance of the magnitude that we're talking about, and I have this n, so how many events per year do I get? Then I can come up with a, um, a yearly probability. I called it a failure. That's an engineering uh, um, terminology. In our case, it would be of occurrence of that a certain event of the same magnitude or higher, let's say of COVID-19 can happen in any given year, okay? So with the data, we can build these two uh, um, descriptors, quantitative descriptors and come up with this value of P, which is really the basic piece of information that one needs to, uh, to plan, to be prepared. Um, so the data were not there. Um, and it took me uh, about a year to go over a lot of sources um, to dig up from 1600 to present uh, doc the documentation of past epidemics. Uh, eventually, the final um, data set that is publicly available, you see here in Zenodo, contains uh, almost 500 uh, documented epidemics. For many of those, we also have the numbers of, uh, of deaths, the number of victims. Um, for some of them, we only have the, the information about the fact that they occurred. Um, so now we had data that we could use to, to apply a, um, a, a, a quantitative approach to this. And so we did. But the problem was, the interesting thing was actually, if I, if I, of course, it's, it's interesting because it makes you understand stuff. 
uh, that occurrence, we, we separate it with this approach, which by the way, is not a very standard approach in extreme value theory. Uh, this is a very recent approach that uh, I've been working on with, uh, with uh, collaborators for some time that has advantages that I will not bore you with. Um, but one of these, the, the one important advantage here is that it separates the two terms, the occurrence and, and the probability distribution. So the occurrence process, and you can see here, this is the number of events per year over time since 1600. The occurrence is not stationary. You can see, you don't need to be a very sophisticated statistician to see that there is no, no there is a, a change taking place here. It's a non-stationary process. So there, uh, that's the first difficulty because then you have to say, well, what about the future? We will have to make assumptions about what's going to happen in the future. Is it going, do we expect an increase? Do we have accept uh, decreases in the occurrences and so forth? The other part of the of the of the model of the of the um of the way we can describe the process, so the f of x, the probability distribution. Uh let me, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh yeah, here finally needs us to specify what, what is the metric we're going to use. So the metric we decided to use um, had to do with the fact that because of the non -stationary, underlying non-stationality, for example, in global population, the global population has changed uh, a lot since the 1600s. Uh, we needed a, a non-dimensional uh, description. So the idea was take, not, taking just the number of deaths would not do it because you cannot compare uh, you know, the Black Plague with, uh, with say, the Spanish flu, because simply the, the world was very different, at least in terms of the number of people who could be affected by, by that. So the idea was uh, take the number of deaths, uh, um, of course, but divide by the global population so you get a non-dimensional um, description and divide by the duration of the epidemic, which is, I think, very important here because also for applications, you want to know what's really important is not the overall amount of, of victims, really, because that can occur over a long period of time. Um, uh, HIV, for example, I mean, uh, it, it's caused 40 million deaths, unfortunately, but over a very long time span, whereas the Spanish flu caused between 50 and 100 million uh, 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 deaths over two to three years. So it's really the intensity, how many uh, people will, will die per, per unit time that should, should be of most concern, because that's, as we have seen, going to, to put uh, our health system to the test more than anything else. So define relative intensity. Now we have all the data that we could use for each of these um, uh, epidemics uh, to compute this relative intensity. So we, that's what we did. Uh, and, and this is now the, the sequence of events uh, transformed into, into epidemic intensity. Um, and the following step was to use this information to build the F, the uh, probability of exceedance, the, 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 the probability that once an event has occurred, it will exceed a certain value x, a certain, in this case, a, a, a relative intensity as we have defined it. And this is where we discovered something that I think, you know, I, I'm still, we're still working on it and I, I still find it fascinating and, and unexpected. If you compute that F, that probability distribution, everything falls so nicely along this what we call a generalized Pareto distribution, which you know doesn't matter what the, form, the analytical formulation is, the, the the important fact about it is that the the tail, the part of the of, of this probability distribution that describes the the most intense events, is a power law, is a power law. It's not an exponential. It's not another another function. Power law unfortunately means that the probability the probability of a large event decays 
goes to zero very slowly for large epidemic intensities. So it's not good news, but still, it's still very fascinating. And you see that all these uh, different, very different events, very different epidemics, very different diseases with different uh, mechanisms of transmission fell very, uh, very tightly around a certain, uh, this one distribution. And you see this gray area, this is what an, a, a, an, uh, an exercise we did, but perturbing, we know that it are very uncertain. So we perturbed, we said, well, okay, uh, who says it was 20, 25,000 people who died in that particular epidemics? Let's perturb it by plus or minus 50%. And let's see how that affects the probability distribution. And in fact, you see the gray area is very tight around the red line. So we're very confident that whereas the occurrence process is non stationary, it varies widely in time, there seems to be some level of universality in the probability distribution of these very diverse um, events. And here we can find COVID-19 over here. Well, you know, if you've been to Venice, there's a famous church, there's a famous, still to this day, uh, a famous celebration uh, in summer about the end of the plague. And, and this is the plague uh, at that time. So this a dot here uh, on this line. So it's it's really, really amazing to me how, how that works so nicely. Um, and we might say more about that later. Um, so now uh, let's get to that, to, to the answer the question, the original question. So how, how likely it is to have another uh, pandemic of that level, of that intensity? Now we've defined the, the metric. And so that's what we do uh, often. We do, that's actually what we do all the time in engineering. So if you want to say, uh, to look at what's the probability of failure of a dam, there's a, you know, this is the formula, it doesn't matter. You can use the, uh, the, the P, the small P, this one, this guy over here, this one over here, you can use it in this formula to get what is the probability that over the lifetime of the dam, say 100 years, it will fail because the event, an event will occur that exceeds its ability to withstand it. And so this is a typical value. That's a 1% uh, value, uh, 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 probability. For a bridge, this is a higher value. A, a, given the fact that we accept a higher risk, this is almost 40%. That over its lifetime, there will be an event that will risk sweeping it away. Maybe it will not sweep it away, will damage it, but something over the design, above the design event will occur. So how about COVID-19? So if you do the computations and here, the, it's, uh, you know, you have all the details if you want, but the bottom line here, the bottom line here is that without interventions, without mitigations, if we didn't do anything, the size of that event is one that occurs over our lifetime, over 100 years, of course, that's a bit uh, optimistic. Uh, uh, as a life duration, but still, you know, it's a reference. So the uh, probability that one such event will occur in the next 100 years, or it will be exceeded, is about 20%. It's just a, a, just um, uh, almost 20%, 17%. And this is incredibly high to me. That was, a, a, you know, a moment that we said, oh, we were completely, we really were helpless. We didn't know what to do for an event that has a 20% probability of happening in 100 years. It, to me, that that really sounded uh, uh, like complete, complete, uh, uh, inad completely inadequate. Um, then we looked at the literature and here maybe Bill will be able to elaborate. I'm, I'm quickly going to the end. Uh, this probability can change significantly if that N the frequency of occurrence of new diseases changes. And there's studies that have shown that this uh, frequency can change significantly over time and has in fact changed uh, over uh, recent years. Uh, so if one 
assumes that tripling in, in, in the probability of occurrence, which has happened in the recent past at a global scale, that easily we get a doubling or more than a doubling of that probability that I just showed you. So we have a tool that can allow us by to, to build scenarios about what may happen in the future if one assumes different scenarios of event occurrence. That is the, uh, the, the, important, the important factor that can change uh, over time. So um, I will uh, really go over it very, very quickly. What is important, I think, an important message here is that now with, with a framework like this, we now have quantitative information to plan. And if you look at the expected costs of epidemics, and the cost of investments that might be put in place to mitigate the effects of a, of a potential epidemic that occurs over the next uh, years, I mean, we, we're, it's just large investments are really justified because we've seen that the probability is not small and the damage is huge as we have sadly experienced uh, with COVID-19. So uh, these, my, these are my conclusions. Um, and I just leave them on the on the screen. Uh, we have a quantitative approach. We have data now, finally, to to tackle this. Uh, there's a lot of implications about the way we can be better prepared for epidemic uh, risk in the future. And um, with that, uh, I'll just uh, leave it to to Bill to take over and uh, and and talk about possible implications. Thanks, Marco. As we transition, are there any quick questions for Marco as I begin my slides over here? Hold on a second, then. If I could just ask a quick question. Um, Marco, you talked about uh, the, the global population size increasing and how you normalized for that. Um, but the world's also changed in other ways. I mean, we're so much more connected now. Um, you know, it's, it's more than just a global, uh, a, a larger population. It's also more connected. Um, have you thought at all about how, you know, how to incorporate those kind of changes and whether, you know, the risk might actually be quite a bit higher than you calculated because of those changes? So that, that's, uh, that's, uh, clearly a spot on question. Um, we are connected faster. We're not more connected. So. One of the uh, sources that I've uh, looked into uh, quite a bit is an encyclopedia of, of uh, epidemics, which has uh, like one page description of what's happened. And then typically the story goes, uh, you know, this ship arrived in this, in this port and one sailor had uh, the plague. And, and, and so you realize that really the connection was there it took maybe two months rather than one day. We know that you know it took one one person flying on an airplane from China to to Italy, in fact, uh, to to start things here. Uh, but over 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 two you know over the duration of an epidemic, um, yeah, a few months are not that much in the end. So uh, my that's my explanation. Uh, of course. Um, uh, there's no truth here, but I think it's uh, it makes sense. And and as you look at these epidemics, you realize that the connection was there, really. And and, and Charlie, actually, I do I do discuss that in the next presentation. And I will okay. say, you know, Marco and I, when we first started this, and we got farther along, we did start thinking about whether or not there was some way of measuring connectivity from the 1500s until now. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, it, it's a difficult database to put together globally. That's what I'll tell you. Um, and especially putting it together over a 500 year period. Um, it, it's not something that you can do quickly. And and I don't, I'm not sure we can do it that well. Um, I mean, it, it would be very broad, but possibly a PhD dissertation topic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we will take one more question before I start. I think David's got his hand um, up. Yes, thank you. Um, so one of the things that typically we do in modeling extreme events is look at what the um, kind of tail of the distribution would look like. It seems like I, I, 
I did some modeling of this for my PhD dissertation, and my my understanding is generalized Pareto distributions seem to imply that there's a non-trivial chance of um, death rates significantly in excess of the total population of Earth, right? Like if, if you go further out on the tail of the distribution, you end up with things that are very clearly not um, plausible as the fit. So uh, the question is like, how how useful is this if really what you care about is the tail? Um, it seems like you, you would be overestimating it. Uh, so thank you for this question because I wanted to put in the paper the estimate of doomsday uh, probability. And, and actually we have a number, I honestly forgot what it is, um, but the reviewers uh, suggested we leave it out. I thought it was a nice uh, angle to it, but it is not as large as you uh, might suggest, you have suggested. Actually, it's, it's very small. It's like one in millions, uh, several millions of years. So it is a power law distribution. So it has a fat tail. That's that's how we call it. Um, uh, but still, the probability of having a relative intensity vehicle to one, so everybody dying in one year basically, um, is is super small. So I think it's not uh, uh, negating the the validity of the of the. It's actually fairly reasonable to me. Uh, um, and I can provide you the, the exact number because I have it somewhere um, uh, in the original so, manuscript that we sent. Yeah, I, I don't think you need it to be equal to one if you have a pandemic that lasts for more than um, the time period size. So you would assume that the pandemic lasts for more than a year and you could have a number significantly less than one and still have. Yeah, but it still would be say zero point five. Here we're one in a uh, so it's like zero point zero three per meal. So we're really, really, really far from from that. And and then you could argue uh, we would come up with a solution. So the the epidemic should kill us before we come up with a vaccine or some other treatment. So if it were to last more than a few years. So now we're speculating, of course, this is kind of almost sounds like science fiction, but you could argue that uh, if it lasted longer, then you would have time to come up with a solution, uh, which we, you know, partly did. I mean, it was incredible that we came up with a, with a vaccine in what, a year or, or something. Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, so that's my, at least what my, my understanding. So let me just start. I was uh, I was looking up that number. I couldn't find it. I know we had uh, Gabby had actually really was pushing to have that doomsday number, which it was quite a catchy sentence that we had in there originally. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm actually gonna switch a little bit just to talk about the main questions that we were getting after the article was published, and the the thing that I want to tell everybody is that. Uh, especially for people who are in public health or in epidemiology. Um, you know, when, when I was, when Marco actually contacted me about getting involved in this and how they wanted to use this method that's used in, you know, uh, hurricane and extreme climate events to measure the return time of a big epidemic, I was very skeptical that that application would actually be useful in a public health context. And I was completely shown that I was incorrect that this method actually um, demonstrates the, uh, I, I would say, the power of interdisciplinary collaboration and really, um, you know, using and borrowing tools from other disciplines so you can get some insight into uh, to how we think about, um, you know, different sciences. And in our case, this is preparedness and public health preparedness. And, and what we actually do uh, with information that we have. So when we when we put this out, like there was there's so many things that we can talk about, by the way. Um, and so I was just trying, I, I just wanna summarize a couple of things very quickly and get to some discussion 
um, with everybody. So I'm not going to talk very long, but I do want to mention the biggest question we always got was, you know, like Marco said, what's the likelihood that a virus is going to become a pandemic and what is going to cause an increasing likelihood that that's going to happen? And then there were a lot of questions about genomic surveillance, because remember, we published this in 2021. The pandemic was still going on. And in the news, there was a lot of things being discussed about how genomic surveillance could have saved us or could have played a major role in identifying whether or not COVID was coming out. But then, of course, there were all these things discussed about population growth, how we do food. Um, and in, in, one, in the One Health context that Michael had first talked about when he was introducing Marco and I, uh, one of the things we always talk about is environmental degradation and the interface between humans and animals and how that has changed over time and has really changed the frequency of disease emergence and how we think about um, pandemic preparedness. So what I want to show you, this is, you know, I, I added this graph this morning. This is a paper that came out about two days ago and really summarized nicely what I have been thinking about um, in terms of how different diseases emerge in human populations. This is a graph that talks about how the Amazon is on a much faster tipping point globally than we once thought. Um, but it demonstrates the fact that we have compounding problems that are affecting our environments and where we live, how we interact as people um, with our environment. So the top left uh, graph in this orange yellow, or I guess the reddish yellow color, shows the mean temperature change in the dry season um, across 1981 to 2020 and just shows you how things are getting hotter faster. And then the middle graph on the top is, is a graph that shows ecosystem stability. And then the next graph is on extreme droughts and then a road network in the bottom left and then protected areas in the bottom middle. And then the most important one is the bottom right panel. Um, and that really shows this transition, an ecosystem transition potential. And so this is kind of the collective effect of, of climate change, global climate change, regional climate change of the Amazon, because there's a internal cycle in the Amazon where water is recycled within the Amazon itself, land management problems, governance or lack of governance in tropical environments, environmental justice issues where you have indigenous populations having conflict with resource extraction and also just regular colonists, land rights issues, human population growth and expansion, um, all sorts of things that are affecting the fragility of a tropical biome. This is one context. This is just one biome in the world where we are really struggling on how we are managing how we interact with our environment. And the Amazon is just one example you can talk about the Congo, you can talk about Madagascar, then you can move to say grassland areas, you can move to dry land areas, and we have the same complex problems that we're trying to deal with. And you end up having different uh, um, diseases emerging that probably would not have emerged um, in the same way. Charlie had asked about population, right? So when you look at the graph of epidemics over time from 1500 to now, a lot of people always say, oh, population growth is a major driver. Yes and no. Um, it's not just population growth. We have been pre-programmed to fear migration and refugees. It's all over the news constantly. You hear this, whether or not you're in the United States, Europe, Australia, all these you know, high-income countries publishing articles about the threat of migrants spreading disease and other problems. Um, some of these articles, like there's there's one on the lower left about the, um, the public health alerts. So this article describes how the Chicago Health Department said that there was a 90% increase, uh, I'm sorry, 90% increase in chickenpox cases, but almost all from new arriving migrants. 
And then the article continues to talk about how migrants are causing increased transmission risk, how there's also a state, uh, an Illinois uh, rule, or I guess a new uh, launched phone number about syphilis and congenital syphilis that's increasing in the state. It fails to actually go and discuss the fact that the Chicago Health Department also stated that the vaccine for chickenpox is extremely effective. There's no known cases of transmission from migrants to residents. And in reality, the public should not be worried. With syphilis, it has nothing to do with the migrants. That's an increase that started well before the pandemic, well before the migration crisis that started. But yet the insinuation is migrants are causing massive problems. What we don't pay attention to is this. So these are pictures that I took in the top right. This is Lisbon Airport 2022. I came in, had to be about 7,000 people waiting in line to go through customs. Um, on the lower left is a picture in Venice when I was teaching last summer. And you've got, um, and this happens all the time in Venice, but you've got um, lots of people interacting with animals, wild animals. Um, while we have a major global avian influenza pandemic, which hasn't spilled over into humans in a great number, but yet still means that you know, like this is the human interface that I'm talking about. In the lower right is in the Amazon um, after uh, a gold mining trip that we were on. We stopped in an indigenous village, and you can't. I don't know if you can see it, but a monkey ran into the. Uh, it, it's down here on the lower right. A monkey ran into the restaurant that we were having uh, lunch in, um, and apparently this monkey and the family lives in the community and knows that it can come into that restaurant and get food. Um, so the, the, the family feeds the, the monkey family. Um, it's just a you know, primate just coming in. Um, and I, what, I, what I don't show in this picture is that there's also dogs in this uh, restaurant that sniff and come very close to these primates. Um, and, you know, we, we don't really think twice about this kind of human animal interface. The other thing about population is it's not just population size and how we're interacting with animals. This uh, graph right here, you can't, this is the uh, amount of total forest and natural grasslands that exist from 1500 until now. Now, the data are not great. It was estimated from um, different sources that um, our world and data actually compiled together, but it basically shows a rapid uh, increase in agricultural extension from the 1700s and 1800s, industrialization in the 1900s or late 19, early 1900s, where you have a massive change in the amount of land being converted to agriculture, and then kind of a continued change over time. Now, I look at that change and I see a much more correlative relationship between the number of diseases and pandemics being identified in our data than when you see a relationship with population growth. The last thing I just want to show you with forest cover, uh, this again is a series of graphs that was shown about land use change from 1960 to 2019. This was published in 2021. Essentially what the article tells us is that uh, land use change, in other words, the conversion of natural forest or grassland into human use uh, affects about 32% of the terrestrial land area of Earth. And it's estimated now to be four times greater than what was previously estimated. So if you look at, for example, uh, this is cropland expansion where they have areas that are stable cropland, areas that are gaining in, in terms of extensifying areas and areas that are losing cropland. Now, there's not a lot of red in here. There's a couple areas of red maybe in Europe, but most of the world is basically seeing uh, a gain in cropland. And then this one is about pasture. And again, you kind of see the same story of, uh, of generally speaking, you see a bigger gain in the amount of pasture uh, land that's occurring. Now, why is this important? When we think about how diseases are emerging, right, in, uh, in human populations, there are many, many things that drive the relationship between a spillover in terms of like a, a virus affecting uh, an animal or other kind of host reservoir uh, into humans. 
everything from population growth, food systems, how we are moving around the landscape, how we're growing food, where we put our houses. The climate is going to be a major effect on, on how uh, viruses, parasites, and other pathogens exist in the environment. Um, extreme events uh, are which are, I believe are, in my opinion, slightly different than, say, the climate changes occurring because extreme events cause a greater disruption in the environmental conditions that we live in. Um, and so that's going to probably lead to more uh, um, spillover events occurring. So when Marco published or you know discusses that 17% uh, probability of a COVID-19-like event returning, that assumes that a lot of these changes aren't occurring because that's a number that is built on things that are happening prior to rapid population growth, prior to rapid climate and land cover changes that are occurring. So in my personal opinion, that is a big underestimated number that we are uh, that 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 we talk about. And it's likely, I don't know what the number would be, right? It's but I think 17% is likely a lower bound of the likelihood of a of a COVID-19 uh, like epidemic occurring again. Um, that's all I have to say. I, I think that it's nice to have a conversation and I'd love to have some questions both for Marco and I and uh, kind of discuss more about this paper and, and what it means uh, for for humans, for research and other things. So thanks a lot. So, um, Bill and Marco, thank you. That was great. Um, there are a number of questions in the chat. And um, so, I don't know, Johnny, if you want to help with this, I've been monitoring them, but I have to go all the way back up, I guess, to find the first one. So, let's see. Um, so, so, there was some chat okay. between, I think, David and Mohammed um, initially. And it looks like they kind of had a real conversation. We can pick that one or we can skip ahead to Kathleen, I think is the next one. Okay. So I don't know if Bill and Marco, if you see that one, but it's on historical data. How do you account for the fact that some historical sources, particularly pre-1800, will have numbers of deaths that are not accurate by current standards, but chosen by the authors for cultural or social reasons? So we, so yeah. Marco can answer this more thoroughly because uh, he he did more of the research on extracting some of the deaths and the pandemics. But we did look up many different sources in trying to find accounts of epidemics, uh, both you know, and not just English language or Italian, since Marco's Italian, you know. But we we looked in multiple languages to try to figure out if we could find some more data. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we try to minimize that effect. Um, also, I, I um, discussed uh, earlier how we uh, perturbed the data to see how robust the result was to the uncertainty. And we assumed that to the uncertainty uh, with which we know the numbers. So we assumed uh, plus or minus 50% you could, of course, argue that you should, you could do more, you could do less, but you know it's a hundred percent range around, around the original value, um, and and you know I can show it again, but that gray area, around the the the, the red line, the, the the red distribution, does show that the essence, the the nature of that distribution doesn't change. So we feel. Uh, that's a very robust uh, result. Also, I had noticed a question earlier, um, I don't know, that, that goes, um, that, that raises a similar point in relation to, uh, say, the um, South American uh, um, colonization uh, epidemics. So some of those are, uh, you know, pre-1600, so... Uh, that they, they don't wouldn't enter the picture. Clearly, we don't have all the, um, the record doesn't contain all the epidemics that have ever occurred. Um, also, China is underrepresented because there's no, there was no um, systematic reporting. However, the approach that separates 
the occurrence process, the number of events per year, and the probability distribution of the magnitude is robust because it really needs a sample of magnitudes that is statistically significant, large enough. It doesn't need to contain all the epidemics. So again, the GPD, the power law tail, is still robust with respect to the fact that we don't account for all possible epidemics. Of course, uh, the number of epidemics per decade or per year, or whatever, however you want to measure it, that needs to be discussed more thoroughly, meaning particularly if you want to project into the future, you need to uh, to 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 uh, formulate hypothesis about you know how is that going to change like like, uh, like Bill was talking about what are the factors and what's reasonable to assume for for the near future and but but uh, at least you have a tool that based on these scenarios can allow you to come up with uh, a, an estimate of the probability. Great, I think that um, I uh, I did wonder a little bit when you get way out on that parallel power law distribution, you know, that David was referring to where you could have the funny calculation where you have more deaths than people. Um, but I also wonder how that risk then kind of compares to the risk of a global killing asteroid hitting the planet. I mean, you know, you get out to these extreme events and it's kind of like, okay, but, you know, right. Um, so yeah, well, well, you cannot have more people killed than there are because if you're using relative intensity, your variable is a fraction. Yeah, is a fraction of population per unit time. So that's by definition uh, bounded. So you don't get uh, unreasonable results there. Um, and again, the the return period of an event that is going to kill everybody is is very very long and. There's a, there's a paper, a doomsday paper uh, that uh, Gabi Katu likes to, uh, one of our co-authors like to bring up, um, that provides an estimate of the probability that, of human extinction uh, based on other factors, uh, uh, basically asteroids and stuff. And, and interestingly, the order of magnitude is, uh, is quite, Quite similar. So we don't know what will do it. We know that something will do it because there's a finite probability of extinction. So sooner or later, it will happen if you wait long enough. It's a it's a paper by Richard Gott. Right. Yeah. G O T T if you're interested. So I do see there's a, a question about whether the Komogorov Smirnov test was used to assess the fit of the power law distribution, whether it was a good fit in the chat. Um, I don't think so. I, I don't I, we did, no, 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 no. We, we, um, honestly, I'm not a fan of these tests, meaning you have to specify a level. We do it all the time in engineering as well, of course. Uh, but in the end, you you have to specify a, a significance level and uh, why 0 0.05, uh, if it passes, if it's not um, rejected at 0 0.05, is, is it true? Uh, in this case, I, I don't think that that would be a good, uh, good way of assessing whether this is a, 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 good, uh, a good model. I mean, it's a model, of course. Of what what's happening? So no, we we didn't uh, we didn't do it. Um, I I have a question. Um, you, you know, you your kind of inclusion criteria includes a certain number of deaths involved. So these are fatal epidemics, and I wondered if there is any reason to think non-fatal epidemics would follow a different distribution. Whether there's feedbacks associated with fatality. Certainly, over evolutionary time, one could make the argument that of course there are because you're selecting. Um, but whether non-fatal epidemics, of which we've seen lots, or ones that have low fatality, um, in humans anyway, um, you know, whether they should behave the same or different in terms of the fitting these distributions. I wonder what your thoughts are of that. 
Uh, it's an interesting question. I, I, I'm not sure I, I'm qualified or I know the answer. Um, certainly it's a different, uh, it might be a different answer uh, because also behaviorally people act differently. Um, something comes to mind associated to that, which I didn't show, which is the, what we're doing now with, with colleagues in the statistics department. Um, that is also related to the question about Karl Marx and Smithson, if you want. Um, so I am intrigued by the fact that we get this power law, and these diseases are very different. These are like person to person. You have vectors, or you have say water as a as a as a medium for transmission. Uh, so these are very different mechanisms, and and they seem to fall on the same on the same law. So what we do, what we did with them was to separate different types, different types of transmission, not, not each single disease on its own, because otherwise you don't have enough data. But if you separate into three types, then you can look at the probability distribution separately. And then, of course, you need to answer the question, you know, what is fitting better? Are they both, are they all power law? So we use there an approach that is, um, using a, a AIC, a KIK information criterion, because you have different number of, 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 uh, of parameters. The interesting thing that I, that I, can't, I can't show it yet, but we find that if you distinguish in three different families or in one, you actually don't get to describe the samples better, meaning, the number of parameters you add by saying, well, okay, now I have three distinct, uh, three different probability distributions, one for one type, one for the other, one for the other, yet it doesn't justify the introduction of, of additional parameters. So they do seem to really come from the same distribution with the same power law exponent uh, minus 0.71, whatever that means. So that, I think that's a very, I think that's a question. So why is that? Uh, that uh, so I have a number of hypotheses, but I think it's an intriguing question. Michael, yeah. I think that the other thing is just to weigh in one one example is with shark attacks. You know, there's non-fatal shark attacks and there's fatal shark attacks. The fatal shark attacks tend to have more peaks in extreme events that don't seem to relate to non-fatal, that if you were just to look at non-fatal, you probably, I'm not sure if you would see a power law, just, you know, you'd have to look at the data a little bit more, but um, I, I'm not sure it's a directly applicable, but you, know, you you would have to kind of evaluate the distribution to look at it. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are at one o'clock and um, we have a number of questions in the, you know, in the chat, and I see David, you have your hand up. Um, so, so, um, but we always have to be aware of everybody's time here. So, um, let's kind of everybody thank Marco and Bill. It's a, it a fascinating paper. It's a great um, topic, great discussion, and um, I'll encourage everybody to look for the next Club EvMed uh, coming up. Um, and I don't actually remember what the next one is, although somewhere in the email I have a list of some upcoming ones. But Johnny will will get that information out as well. And um, so Bill, thank, thank you. Uh, Marco, thank you. It's fascinating. Really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, people who have further questions, you got their emails there. So, you know, pester them with the questions. <laughs> Absolutely. I know they'll appreciate it. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Good to see everybody.